Biodiversity is a neologism that combines biology on the one hand and diversity, that is, diversity in and of living nature. The word was first coined by E. O. Wilson in 1986 in his report to the first American Forum on Biological Diversity. And since then, it has gained wide currency among biologists, environmentalists, political leaders and concerned citizens. This also coincided with the expansion of interest in extinction towards the latter part of the 20th century. Atakaputa, <laughs> Biodiversity is the glorious blessing of Earth's nature. It announced the presence of life. This diversity in life forms survived as a basic factor for human existence from the very beginning of the evolution of life. The food and economic security that man desires for his future are dependent on the generosity of biodiversity. This wonderful universe of life extends from the microscopic virus to the enormous mammals, from the tiny moss to the gigantic sequoia. These imponderables of life retain a variety in type family, and ecosystem. India is the land of millions and millions of life forms that seek shelter in the endless fascinations of tropical ecosystems that are storehouses of biodiversity. This is one of the major biodiversity-rich countries. There are about 10 biogeographical zones in India that include the Himalayan forest, the Indian desert, the Indo-Gangetic plain, the Eastern and Western Ghats, the coasts, islands, the Deccan Plateau, and the Northeast. As far as traditional communities are concerned, Agricultural biodiversity that has various uses is as important as that of the pristine forests. It was food security that determined the future of human society. India was one of the first aid centers to start agriculture. Indian people cultivate about 51 varieties of grains, 104 varieties of fruits and 55 varieties of vegetables and pulses. Cultivated areas form a vast landscape of eco-culture. Food crops trains were selected over generations. The wealth of cattle contributed biofertilizer, along with labor, to stabilize agricultural production. Traditional know-how made efficient irrigation possible. Local agricultural methods preserved the quality of paddy field soils. For the Indian farmer, agriculture is a culture. A philosophy of life that embraces the totality of nature is a constant undercurrent in their agricultural activity. They preserve for posterity their rich knowledge about seeds, yields and agricultural practices through folk songs, proverbs and other verbal means that form the knowledge basis of traditional know-how. After the harvest, fields became grazing grounds for cattle. An astonishing diversity is seen in domesticated animals and birds in India. 26 indigenous varieties of cattle, 20 varieties of goats, 40 varieties of sheep, 20 varieties of chicken, 
and four varieties of duck. The Indian farmer was an expert at creating new varieties of animals and birds by crossbreeding. They regularly generated new varieties with good traits of domesticated animals like cow, goat, pig and hoss, and also fighter cocks and raising pigeons. These new breeds, derived through crossbreeding of indigenous varieties, were quite capable of satisfying the needs of the Indian farmer, who was not avaricious. By the highly acclaimed Green Revolution, led to a sharp decline in the genetic wealth that the Indian people had preserved so carefully. It severed the roots of existence of the Indian farmer, who had stood firmly on self-sufficiency and created a severe social liability. When the White Revolution, that aimed primarily at the production of milk, created crossbreeds, what was lost was the genetic purity of local Indian cattle. During the publicity campaigns for the Indo-Swiss project, a large number of local studs were castrated. As their lives role was taken over by artificial insemination techniques, several indigenous varieties faced extinction. The virtual cow is one such example. Different communities that have different cultures and lifestyles, differences in language, dress, beliefs, art, music, social structure, farming methods, crop, food, and so on. Cultural diversity among population is but part of biodiversity. It was this cultural diversity that helped people to face and overcome the challenges of different surroundings. Some communities lived in harmony with nature, utilizing its resources and not destroying its biodiversity. Nature provided them their sustenance, food, clothing, shelter, and raw materials for their work. Humans started agriculture in the Neolithic age. Even today, a human community depends for their survival on about 50 plants and about 10 animals that our ancestors tamed 10,000 years ago. It is believed that one third of the entire plant diversity is edible, that only a small part of this vast food resource, which could relieve the hunger of the entire world population, is known to modern society. The food security of today's world is dependent on just about 15 varieties of plants. Village folk continue to protect the diversity of food grains by wrapping in hay or concealing in bamboo sticks and churaka husks. These rural folk, who refuse to consume the paddy kept apart as seed, even in the midst of severe poverty, are the real protectors of biodiversity. Our food production was sustained through critical periods of disease and natural calamities by wild species of food crops. Venetia's paddy fields were gripped by the devastating grassy stunt virus. The International Rice Research Institute of Philippines created the crossbred variety, IR36, from the wild paddy species Orisa nevada, after screening 6,273 varieties of paddy. It was this globally popular, high-yielding variety of paddy that played an important role in the Green Revolution. Orisa corteta, the wild paddy species from the Sundarbans. Orisa myriana, from the Agastevano. Orisa perinese, that grows as a weed in paddy fields. Almost 50,000 endemic varieties that persist even in the machine tracks of the Green Revolution. There still exist myriad varieties of paddy that could potentially donate their germ plasm 
to new varieties to be bred in the future. Ecosystems diversity forms the pillars that support biodiversity. What wildlife sanctuaries, national parks and global heritage centers do is to preserve biodiversity within the diversity of ecosystems. The Western Ghat forests that stretch over 1,600 kilometers from Tapti in Gujarat to Kanyakumari are storehouses of biodiversity. They are the source of invaluable genetic material and forests of the Western Ghats are the birthplace of several food crops like cardamom, nutmeg, pepper, ginger, turmeric, jackfruit, mango, and so on. Even now, there exist many wild relatives of these species in the Western Ghats. Anila Kurungi, Strobilanthus kunthianus, that flowers only once in 12 years, and several others of the Strobilanthus group. very rare rocket Ipsia malabarica that is on the verge of extinction and several other orchid species. More than 60 species of balsam are to be found here. Of the 4,000 odd species of flowering plants in the Western Ghats, 51 genus and 1,600 species are endemic to this region. This high level of endemism makes the Western Ghats region one of the hotspots of biodiversity in the world. The diversity of animal species is also fascinating in this ancient home of life forms that survived continental drift and climatic changes. Many mammals like the Nilgiri tar, the lion-tailed macaque, and others are endemic to the Western Ghats. The high grasslands of the Western Ghats are the home of the Nilgiri tar, the Irabikulam National Park is the main centre where these stars graze, moving blithely over almost vertical rock formations. The lion-tailed macaque is an extremely rare animal of the Western Ghat region. These animals use a vast region of the evergreen ecosystem for food gathering. Precisely for that reason, the destruction of the ecosystem has taken these mammalian species to the edge of extinction. Monkeys are the ancestors of humans. There are 11 species of apes, monkeys and lemurs in India. The Sundarbans, one of the most fertile ecosystems in India, is the main center for the rhesus monkeys. Enriched by the organic matter brought by the Himalayan rivers, the Sundarbans forms the world's largest river delta an organic chain that includes mudskippers that roll in the dirt, crab species that help combine biomass with soil, turtles, water monitors, king cobras, and deers. At the top of this food pyramid reigns the crocodile in the estuary and the tiger on land. The destruction of biodiversity continues even as conservation measures become active. 15 million hectares of tropical forests are destroyed each year. 20,000 species disappear. 50 species are lost each day. Several factors contribute to the laws of biodiversity. Dams once considered the temples of progress, introduction of exotic species, and overexploitation of bioresources.
loss of ecosystems results in the loss of some species. Ex situ measures that conserve them outside their natural habitats play an important role here. It is in this context that botanical gardens and zoological gardens become relevant. Around 12 to 15,000 species have preserved in botanical gardens the world over. The Royal Botanical Garden established by Robert Kidd on the banks of the Hooghly in Kolkata is one of the oldest in the world. Known as the Indian Botanical Garden in post-independence India, the center has a rare collection of plants of economic importance from all over the world. The palm house here maintains 115 species of palms. The Indian Botanical Garden was the first breeding center for exotic species like tea, rubber, and mahogany. The main attraction here is a giant banyan tree that covers half a hectare with a circumference of 420 meters. The Tropical Botanical Garden and Research Institute in Palod, Thiruvananthapuram, has a rare collection of plants from delicate tropical ecosystems. Ferns, wild orchids, bamboo species, figs, wild decorative plants and medicinal plants are conserved in separate conservatories here. The institute has modern facilities for ex situ conservation like a national gene bank, a seed bank and the cryobank. Several endemic medicinal plants like the Decalypsis arealpatra are available in the medicinal garden here. Endemic species like the Edimocarpus fisheri and Philanthus gagiana are wild ornamental plants. Forty percent of the plants in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are endemic. Comparable to the Malaysian forests in the distribution of plant species, 20 percent of the plant in the Andaman forests are not found in India. The rare Andaman species are protected here. Life is like a book that can never be completely read. The endless fascination of the deep oceans. The tiny worlds of invisible microorganisms. There still remains many living environments which human eyes have not yet seen. Three centuries back, in a Pishnoi village near Jodhpur, 362 villagers led by Amrutha Devi sacrifice their lives to protect their KG trees. Leading their lives in accordance with the 29 commandments of their community's guru, Ramboji, the Pishnois continue to maintain a love for the environment as a religious belief. There are parallels in India to the Pishnoi villagers who feed wild animals with their own hands. Sacred groves that are preserved for the sake of religious belief exhibit the same kind of special sense for the preservation of biodiversity. There are sacred groves all over the country, known as Devarkadu in Karnataka, as Nagam and Kavu in Kerala, as Kenkri in Rajasthan, as Devarai in Maharashtra, as Sharana in Bihar. These calves, which are the lungs of the village, are also storehouses of biodiversity. As in the Western Ghats, the species in the calves are also highly endemic. There are three species of medicinal orchid nervilia in the sacred groves of Kerala. Plants like gymnostachium, which is the local antidote for viper poison, and Kunzleria keraliensis, which was first identified in the sacred groves of Alapura, or all species confined to the calves.
Temple ponds and other holy bathing ghats are also homes to animals like tortoises and fishes. The practice of offering rice and food to tortoise and fish being cured of diseases is still prevalent in many villages in India. Several fishes like the Hora bagras and Indian Mahasira are being protected as a result of these religious beliefs. Muggers were common in the temple ponds and freshwater lakes of Kerala till about a century back. In Kerala, this endangered reptile remains only in the temple pond of the Anantapuri temple in Kasargod district. Most vegetable dye plants are found in marginal environments and are used by folk performers, artisan communities, weavers, traditional painters and potters. Erosion of diversity has affected these plants too. Owing to this, the living condition of marginal communities have become more miserable. There is a growing demand for vegetable dyes in view of the adverse environmental and human health impact of synthetic dyes. The ban on aso dyes and textiles by Germany has provided the first incentive to conventional textile exporters to pay attention to vegetable dyes. The use of vegetable dyes is prevalent now in the toy industry as a remedy to the health problems created by artificial dyes. The aborigines of Jamaica used to drink water boiled with leaves of periwinkle as a cure for diabetes. The most powerful drugs available today for leukemia namely wind christine and wind blastin are derived from periwinkle. Several drugs being used in modern medicine like recipin, quinine and aspirin are gifts from traditional knowledge. About 3,000 antibiotics including penicillin, cyclosporin and tetracycline are derived from microorganisms and fungi. The modern health system today looks towards biodiversity for a cure for killer diseases, like AIDS. The hope of the future lies in knowledge handed down from one generation to another, as in Ayurveda and tribal medicine. But the new world economic order, which bestows monopoly rights even over life forms, is beginning to threaten the very existence of traditional knowledge. The medicinal qualities of turmeric and neem, which were patented in the US were a common property that had behind it the relevance of thousands of years of Indian medicinal science. When biopiracy becomes widespread and the transparency of the biodiversity convention is lost, we will have to face the challenge of protecting our genetic wealth. The Patuum village in Kannur is a model for this. In a campaign spread over two years, the villagers generated a biodiversity registry through data collection and education. Their declaration of ownership of their biodiversity on April 11, 1997, became a model for the whole world.
the confidential nature of traditional knowledge is lost as databases are published. When economic giants enter this area, they never ask permission from the real owners of this knowledge. Neither do they share their profits fairly. There is no clause in the Biodiversity Convention to ensure that they do. It is in the midst of such worries that a biodiversity law which prevents biopiracy ensures a free equity to the owners of the knowledge, protects both agriculture and wild biodiversity, is free from loopholes, becomes relevant. The plenitude of biodiversity is one matter. Equity in its application and exploitation is quite another. And that continues to be an area of concern and possible tension.